Amen. Amen, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I welcome you again to Bible study one more time. Um, our Bible study on the, um, the, uh, um, the order of salvation, ordo salutus, the order of salvation. Um, before I continue tonight, I want to ask if anyone has a pressing uh, question, statement, or remark regarding Bible study in the last 12, now I think 13 weeks um, going on in Bible study. If anyone has a pressing crash question, a statement, or a remark regarding any, uh, any of the subject that we've touched in Bible study, I would like to take the time right now to entertain it. I have a question. All right. It, it, it looks like no one has a pressing question. Uh, oh, like I always you, said, it, you, it means two things. Did somebody can, have their hands? Oh, okay. can you hear me? I think that's Herman. He has a question. You're on mute. You're on mute, Carlene. So I'm not on mute. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Herman. Oh, okay, great. Uh, hi, Pastor James. Hey, um, what's up, man? So just a question thinking about uh, this is kind of going back to the last Bible study as well, but I guess you can kind of tie it in a little bit, really with the what we've been reading in Romans, right? Um in a way, maybe not. Humor me if not. Um, could the if it for God's full glory to be appreciated, right? For every for him for his for his grace and his wrath to to be, uh, they both have to come, right? They both have to come to pass for his full extent of his glory, right? You can't have his grace without his justice, without his justice. And vice versa. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, could could that full glory be uh, manifest or kind of um, witness without the creation of man, without the creation and fall of man? I mean, I know the yes, but and but could it? Again, I, I think it could because of the angels, right? Um, because the angel would still see the glory of God. Again, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, what the seraphim were crying, what? Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What? It says, it says um, what was the last word? Um, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Hold on. Isaiah 6, 3 um, is the last word. I, I want to say it the proper way. Yeah, it says, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Um, and, and, and I pray, and I, I put heaven in as well. The whole earth is full with his glory. So, the, so yeah, so his glory is full. I think his glory would still be manifested and, and the, heavens would, um, um, the heavens would see the glory of God, the full glory of God. And even as we go to heaven, uh, we will, we shall, we shall know him fully, right? We shall see all his glory and all his splendor. So yes, I believe in that case, whether men, whether men um, sin or not, God's full glory would still be manifested. But as, but, but, but because men sin, that part of the justice of God must be manifested. Otherwise, God is not true to himself. Because as much God is a loving God, he's a just God. And he must, he must judge what is wrong. Yeah. So I think whether man had sinned or not, or whether man was created or not, God's glory will still be manifested. But, but again, the Bible made it clearly that one of the primary reasons why God created man is for the purpose of his glory. And one of the reasons why he decided to give salvation to men is for the purpose of, uh, uh, of, of his glory. So some way, somehow, God's glory would still be manifested. Uh, let me know if I answered your question. 
You did, yeah. It was just something I've been thinking of all week. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I understand that obviously God is God by himself again. Yeah, yeah. His glory is, is, God is by, yeah. I think so you put it need... the right way. Is God, God by himself. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in fact, one of the great things is that God, you know, God, God exists in three. And if God existed in one, then there'd be a problem, right? There's no fellowship that, you know, but God exists in three from the beginning. Um, and, and I guess in some way, even with the, the headship of God, I, I mean, the glory would be manifested. I'm looking in that sense. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, yes, I see, I see Zoom user. Go ahead. The Zoom user have a hand up, right? I thought I saw a hand. I see a hand. Yeah, that's me. May, if you if you have your hands up, you could speak. Um, I think that was probably an accident. I didn't have my hand up. Ah, okay. All right. All right. So, okay. So then why don't we get going then? Um, as, we've been, as, as we've been saying, we're studying the order of salvation. And in studying the order of salvation, um, the, text that we, the text that we chose uh, was... Um, Romans chapter 8, verse 30, which you should know by now, Romans chapter 8, verse 30, and in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, uh, uh, Apostle Paul said, for whom he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also um, justified, and those he justified, he also sanctified, and those he sanctified, he also glorify. And I will say it every time on this, in this Bible study, because we can see that all the tenses of the verbs are in the past tense. That means they've already accomplished, God have already accomplished them, even though some of them are not yet come to pass because we are not fully sanctified and we are not yet glorified yet. Um, and there are some people that are not yet called. There are some people that are not yet uh, um, justified. Yet they've, the, all, the, all these things have already taken place on the side of God. Um, the other thing we always say, we we'll say as well, the word also uh, is a word for us to pay attention. The word also means that God will not just, God will not um, Cho choose predestined anyone he will not call because those he called he will also those he chose he will also uh, uh, um, call and if he called you he will also justify you and if he justify you he will also sanctify you and if he sanctify you he will also glorify you so he's not going to predestine someone who is not going to call. And therefore, the idea of losing your salvation is just not biblical. If you are truly one who is in Christ Jesus. And we've been saying there are two main ways to know that you are truly called by God, that you are truly a believer, that you are truly going to heaven, is one, the Holy Spirit will testify to your, to your spirit that you are the children of God. It's not something that you're going to, you have questions about, is that you know that you are a child of God. Uh, just like your children know that they are your children, that there's no doubt about it. Um, um, yeah, I, I, have a, I have a little joke that I play with my kids. Now, now I'm playing with, with Hannah. The other one was too, too old to play with that game with them. When they come from school, um, they ring the bell. I put my foot at the door. I open. I say, who are you? And they're like, your daughter? I'm like, I don't know you. Go to your house. Uh, lady, please go home, you know? 
And they're like, no, your dad, your this. And they start pushing the door to come in. And it's a joke that we play, but they know for sure that I'm their dad. So the Holy Spirit will testify to your spirit that for sure, this is your house. This is your father. And not only that, the other thing is your hatred for sin is that you don't look to sin. You don't live to sin. You don't, uh, uh, and if you happen to sin, um, you know, uh, your life is miserable as a child of God because that's what the, the nature, that's the nature of, of, of eternal life. The nature of eternal life is that they may know you, the only true God, is that they may have a fellowship with God, is that we no longer hostile toward God, is that we are free from sin. And it's the nature of eternal life that behooves us, keeps us away from sin, that new nature, that new heart that God gives us at regeneration and so on and so on. So, this week, we are on the subject of sanctification. Sanctification. All the, all the other subjects that we have talked about, God is God only involved God. But this one involved both God and us. It takes two to tangle in sanctification. It takes two to be sanctified. And I will talk a little bit more on that aspect next week, but this week, uh, so I'm going to take two weeks to talk about sanctification. And I guess by the end of this month, we will finish, we will be done with the study of the order of salvation. Um, so, so yeah. So in John chapter 17, if you have your Bible or if you're looking online, in John chapter 17, um, Jesus is praying to the Father. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, and this is what he says to the Father. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world, any more than I am of the world. And he says, this is my prayer to you, Father. It is not that you take them out of the world, but, you, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am of it. And then this is the verse, verse 17. He said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. I want you to understand that this was the night of Jesus' arrest. When he made that prayer, this was the night where they go and Judas would betray him. This was the night where he would be um, sweating blood. In, just, uh, uh, in Gethsemane. The next day, he would be condemned as a common criminal and hung on a Roman cross. And at this moment, as this moment approaches, this is what was frontal on his mind. At the front of his mind, the believer's personal sanctification. But just think about it. When a person is dying and they know they're going to die, they have no time for trivial matters. Their last few words only reserved for that which is of most importance to them. When a person is about to die, they know, they call their closest family and closest friends together and begin to tell them some things. And they're not talking about trivial things, but they will talk, they will talk about what is of most importance to them. So, so just think about it. Jesus is about to die. The primary concern of our Lord on his hour of death 
was the personal sanctification of all true believers. Now, why is that? Why sanctification was at the frontal mind of Jesus? Can anyone take a stab at it? Let me see if you're thinking like I'm thinking. Why do you think that would be the thing Jesus would be praying about? Anyone? Come on, let's, let's take a stab at it. Well, I, I think that he says in the later verse that just as you sent me in the world, mm -hmm. I'm sending them in the world. So, you know, he knows what he's going to go through. And our life in sanctification is, is kind of in that same direction. He's the example. So sanctification is a violent process. Okay. I'll take that, but there is something I'm looking for. And the, the, the main reason, the primary reason why. Anyone else want to take a stab at it before we move on? I think you may um, something to do with being one and the glorification part. Okay. You to be one with his people. Okay. Just as God and him are one. Okay. He knows that that's what it's going to take to get glorification. I think that as I'll take that as well. But but there's can, a primary reason. Can I try? And it's, and it's in the Bible verse. Go ahead, Jen. My my I'm wondering, is it because he knows he's leaving them? Okay. Yeah, he knows he's leaving. But 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 why why? Why praying that God sanctify us? Why would that be at the front of his mind? Um, I, 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 I may say because he knows that this, this is a violent process and he, whatever he's going through, we're going, going to go through it. Um, um, Angie said uh, because he's looking to be one with his people and, and that's the only way it can happen through sanctification, which is true. Um, uh, are you going to say, you, you're going to take a stab at it? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, that's me? good. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I was thinking because it's um a very important um a very important um um so I think it's very um sanctification is very vital towards you know God's glorification. So without it, you know, a person maybe will not glorify the Father. So. Okay, that, that's good. That, that, that's good. You see, he stuck with the word without it, right? I, it, the reason is found in the books of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 14. Without sanctification, what happened? No one will see the Lord. Make every effort to live with peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. I mean, you could be chosen, you could be called, you could be justified, but guess what? Sin cannot enter heaven. Sin cannot enter heaven. Are, we, are, we, are you with me? And without sanctification, no one, no one is a prohibition for all. All without exception. No one will see the Lord. That is the primary reason why Jesus is praying to the Father. Because he knows that without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. I mean, could you imagine that Jesus goes through all that he went through, coming on earth, give his body as a sacrifice, hung on, hung on a cross, being judged six times, three times by the Romans, three times by the Jews, and then beaten in all these other things, and then he has no ROI? No return on investment? 
Because without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. And the reason he came on earth is that we can make it to heaven. And if without sanctification, no one will see God. Not only personal sanctification was Jesus' primary, primary concern, concern, guess what? It was also the, uh, an apostolic concern as well. It was the concern of the apostles as well. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 6, to six verse 15 to 16, what does Apostle Peter say commend to his listeners, to those who were under his teaching? But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For as it is written, talking about the Old Testament, be holy. And this is not, this is not, um, this is a demand. Be holy because I am holy. So it was not just Jesus' Jesus's con concern, first, the, his primary concern. It was also the apostles' primary concern that the people of God would be holy as God is holy. And, I, and, and unless any of us think that this is a New Testament thing, Apostle Peter was quoting Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, 44 to 45, where God says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourself unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. In Exodus chapter 13, um, you're going to see, I'm going to choose a few verses so you could see the God's always demanding the holiness of his people. Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. Sanctify to me every firstborn. Sanctify to me every firstborn. The first offspring of the womb among the sons of Israel, both men and animals. It belongs to me sanctification. If God is going to use something or is going to use someone or going to have fellowship with someone, there is a requirement of sanctification, holiness in the part of this person. Exodus chapter 19, verse 22. Also let the priests who come near to the, uh, near to the Lord consecrate themselves. Or else, <laughs> did you hear that part? Or else, the Lord will break out against them. What you think, what, um, whatever happens to you, happens to you. If you come in my presence and you're not consecrated, you're not sanctified, and you're not holy. In fact, Isaiah told us in his vision that sanctification is the primary concern of heaven. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, the one I just read and when I was talking to, uh, uh, um, to, to Herman, the seraphim, the seraphim did not cry, love, 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 love is the Lord God Almighty, although God is love. They didn't cry out, omniscient, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipotent is the Lord God Almighty. No, they cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Almighty. And whenever you hear something is repeated three times in the Bible, you need to pay attention because it says this is very important. 
What this is saying is the chief attribute of God is his holiness. The chief attributes of God is his holiness. So therefore, it is incumbent of all believers to pursue a sanctified life. And those who are not, let me say this to you. It is incumbent of all believers to pursue a sanctified life. And those who are not pursuing a sanctified life are not true believers in the Lord. If someone is not pursuing a sanctified life, a life of sanctification. They are not true believers in God. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. I've heard people say that before. There is, let me say it to you, there is nowhere in the Bible, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. The people of God must Never confuse people who make profession of faith with people who has the possession of faith. Just because somebody profess with their mouth doesn't mean they have the possession of faith. And just as sanctification is the chief attributes of God, sanctification should always be the mark of all true believer. Because personal holiness is the one overriding desire of God for his people. Personal sanctification is God's overriding desire for his people. Be he holy because I am holy. God is saying, I'm not asking you something that I'm not. Something I like to say to my children, you know, whether it's to wash the dishes or whether to mow the lawn or do something in the house. If they complain, I say, I sit down, I pull them aside and say, please tell me, have I ever asked you to do something that I myself, I don't do? So if I can do it, why can't you? So God is not asking something of us that he does not live by because the chief attributes of God is his holiness. So God is demanding that his people live a life of holiness because without holiness, no one. And that is a general, general no one will see the Lord. So what is sanctification? The word sanctification from the Greek comes from the Greek word hagiapso. The word sanctification comes from the Greek word hagiapso, which has its root in the word hagias, which means holy. See, the word hagias means holy, but the word hagiatso means sanctification or cons consecration. It means, it means holy. It means holiness. It means sent. Sanctification, it means to be set apart. It means to be set apart. It means to be separate from the profane. And one of the most interesting um, definition of the word sanctification, it means to cut in order for there be separation. To consecrate means to cut in order for there be separation. So it is not a suggestion. When you say God is holy, 
What you're saying is God is totally separate from everything else. He's not like everyone, everything else. He's transcendent. He's, he's majestic. He's royal. He's cut from another cloth. He's not like us. It is to be unlike all others in every way. So when God is saying be holy to his people, when he's saying to his people to sanctify themselves, he's telling us we cannot be like the world. If you're going to be my people, you cannot walk like the world. You cannot talk like the world. You cannot behave like the world. But yet I could, I, I, could, I, I could turn on my television or go visit churches. Man, uh, we don't look too different. We don't look too different in the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we behave. We are like the world. And God says that's not going to cut it. Because sanctification means to be separate. We don't bring the world into the church. The world must be outside of the church. Some pastors and some Christians think we can help God. God needs our help. You could help your pocket. You could help your church. You could do whatever you need, certain marketing, whatever you want to do to, to fill the church with people. But you're not helping God. You're helping yourself. Because that's not what God desires. What God desires is holiness. Sanctification. Without which no one will see God. What God requires of all believers is our personal sanctification. What you and me need to understand is that we were not saved just to go to heaven. We were saved to have fellowship with God on earth and with his people. That's the reason why in Psalm 24 verse 3, the psalmist cry out, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has a clean hand and a pure heart. He who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. What he's saying is, who will have the opportunity to fellowship with God? A sanctified person. A sanctified person is, is the only type of people that could fellowship with God. If you want to have communion with God, true communion with God, you must pursue a life of sanctification. You must pursue a life of holiness. And that's the reason why when David sinned in Psalm 51, he says, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. I want to sanctify myself. God doesn't use unsanctified people. Do not confuse gifts with the anointing. Do not confuse giftedness with sanctification. Christianity is a hot religion. It's a hot thing. If our heart have not been regenerated by God, we can ever be holy. We can ever pursue a life of holiness. So if God has regenerated our hearts, truly regenerated our hearts, we will be sanctified because those whom he justified through regeneration, he will also sanctify. 
And that's the reason why the people who are afraid says, please don't preach this. Um, you save, you always save because every time you preach this, people are going to think they can't do anything they want. No, no, not if you teach the whole counsel of the word of God. I didn't come here and talk to you about one save, always save, and then leave it there. No, I teach you the whole entire, the whole counsel of the word of God. Yes, yes. When you come to God, he only gives one type of life, and that is eternal life. He doesn't give any other kind of life. I give them what? Eternal life. But eternal life, the nature of eternal life, once you have it, it behooves you. You cannot live a life of sin. And if you're living a life of sin, you don't have eternal life. You can't have eternal life. You can't be sanctified. You are not sanctified. And without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. Only a regenerated heart has the desire to be holy. And on your generate heart is hostile toward God. In fact, it's like the uh, 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 a, a, a regenerated heart, a justified heart, is like the psalmist says, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul long after um, holiness, after sanctification. Your soul long after it. The psalmist said, you say, seek, seek my face. Your face shall I seek, O God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. In 2 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Do you, you understand what I mean when I said you weren't not just saved to go to heaven, but you were saved and called to live a holy life. There can be no unsanctified believers. Personal holiness must be the distinguishing mark of a true believer. You should pray to God and say, God, make me as holy as a, uh, as a regenerate sinner can be. I want it all. I want it to the max. Whatever a regenerate sinner can attain in holiness, in sanctification, that's where I want to be, God. The holy, holiness in the life of the, of the believer is an ought. We ought, we have to be holy. We must. It's a must. Now, what does it take to live a life of holiness? How do you know you are truly sanctified? You are truly being sanctified. I'm sorry I said sanctified. Being sanctified. It's a process, right? It's a, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But, 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 but what do you do? What, 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 in, what is involved in, in this? What are the parameters of being sanctified? You see, the pursuit of holiness, according to Apostle Paul, must have a put on and a take off. Now pay attention to this. It's very important. There must be a negative and a positive in the life, in, in the pursuit of sanctification. An ongoing exercise of taking off, putting on. Taking off and putting on. And understand that you can't have one without the other. 
It's almost like the song for, for married with children. Love in marriage, love in marriage. You can't have one without the other. You can't have the taking off without the, king, taking, without the putting on. And you can't have the putting on without the taking off. If you have the, put, the taking off, that is without the putting on, that is called legalism. And if you have the putting on and you don't have the taking off, it is still called legalism. Legalism doesn't get anyone to heaven. Legalism doesn't get anyone into fellowship with God. Sanctification does. There must be a taking, a taking, putting on and taking off. Let's, uh, so you could understand what I'm saying. I know some of you are like, what in the world Pastor James talking about? Let's look at Ephesians. Uh, there's a few. I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll like, take, take a look at two main scriptures. Let's look at the, um, the book of Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 22. Actually, I'll start at verse 20. Well, that's um, no, that's okay. You could leave it at 22. I'll just, when you, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desire. To be, made, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's move on. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthful to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk Come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That is what that that it may uh, benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slender, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. Now that I've read it, we, we need to go back again so we could look at this take, um, take off and put on. If we go back to verse 22, in verse 22, what is the first thing that the sanctified person must do? Take off your, put off your old self. The one that was hostile to God. You have to deny that self. The one that sinned against God. You have to make a determination or just like, just like um, Job said, I, I, I made a pact with my eyes that I am um, not to ever look at a woman lustfully. So, so he's saying, this is what I said. I, I made that with myself. Say, so, so therefore, it's a purpose thing that you desire, you decide as a child of God, I'm going to kill that old guy. If it takes every ounce of my effort, if it takes everything I earn, if it takes me losing my friends, if it takes me to lose my reputation, 
I'm going to kill that old guy. Why? Because I have the power, the dunamis in the exousia to do so through the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to live in sin. And that was the, that was the, the sermon last Sunday. Because sin can be avoided. So the one who is in Christ must put in their mind, make the decision, I'm going to kill this old guy. I'm going to commit murder when it comes to the old self. I've been crucified with Christ. So he says, not only you have to take off your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted. And he says, when after you, as you're fighting to take off your old self, you must be fighting to put on the new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I'm going to do everything. I'm not going to go where I used to go. I'm not going to watch the things I used to watch. I'm not going to listen to the things I used to listen. There's certain things that you know that is not Christ-like. The things that we are watching on TV, the things that we are looking on our phone, the things that we are listening to, the things we know they are not Christ-like. We know, we know what feeds the flesh, don't we? Pastor Paul says, if you're going to be sanctified and without sanctification, no one see the Lord, you have to make a conscious decision that I'm going to kill this guy by not feeding him. Because if I decide to watch this, if I decide to listen to this, if I decide to do this, every time I do, I feed him. You know it when you lift weight. Yes, at regeneration, you're a new creation in the eyes of God. But what happens is every time you sin, it's like you're lifting weight. Oh, next time, the biggest sin is easier to do. And next time, easier to do. And you find yourself living in sin? You have to kill that guy. You have to take off the old self. But as you're taking off the old self, you are putting on the new self. So that's the first thing Apostle Paul said. Then he goes and says, therefore, therefore, if that is your desire to take off your old self, the first thing to try not to do is to speak falsehood, is to lie. Take off, put off falsehood. Decide that. I'm telling you, this is one of the best things a Christian can do. A young man or a young person who wants to grow in the Lord, an old man, an old woman, a widow woman, anyone you are, you want to grow in the Lord, number one thing, decide to yourself, I will not lie, even if it's to save myself. Because you know, the devil is the father of lie. And those who lie are his children. And he likes it when you lie. And every time you lie about something, and you lie about it the second time, fifth time, by the time you get to the sixth time, you believe it yourself. Now, when you tell it, it's not telling a lie. You're just telling something that is true. As if it was true. Paul says the number one thing is to put on false, put up falsehood. Not going to lie. And speak truthfully to your neighbor. Not only your neighbor, but I would say to yourself. Because we lie to ourselves too. And then the second thing he talks about you need to take off is in verse 26. 
in your anger. He doesn't say don't get angry. See, it doesn't mean a Christian cannot be angry. And that's where sometimes we get it wrong. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Watch yourself how you behave when you're angry. Don't be angry like the rest of the world. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. When you do that, you give the devil a foothold. He says, instead, take care of it, whatever it is. If your brother Mike does something wrong, your sister Becky does something wrong, deal with them. Don't, 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 don't go to sleep with it. And your anger did not sin. And in verse 28, it says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Paul says, a sanctified person cannot have sticky fingers. By the way, let me plug let me plug in something here god says when when you, when you don't pay your when you don't give your offering and your tithe you're stealing no matter how little it is don't steal work with your hands so that you could help others Anyone who still must still no longer. But he says we must work doing something useful with our hand that we may have something to share with those in need. This is another one. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Christians don't curse. And you don't use alternate words. I see people using the word freaking for the word F you. It is still a curse. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. It, it's not just cursing, but any conversation that is not seasoned with grace. Like I, used, like I used to say in this church, I don't think I've said it, I haven't said it in a while. I used to say this stuff. The absent must be safe. If somebody's not around and you're talking bad about them, that's unwholesome talk. Un, unwholesome talk. Gossip. Cursing. And that's the reason why the Bible says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is kind, think of this thing. These are the things that feed sanctification. The new man. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And he says, but only what is helpful for building others up. I guess that is true. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. What is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. And there's another one. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you and I both know what we are, whatever you are doing that grieves the Holy Spirit. You know when the Holy Spirit is great. Whatever it is that you're doing, you know the Holy Spirit is grief. 
Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That's why David said, cast me not away from your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I guess the Holy Spirit will not be taking away from you, but the Holy Spirit can be angry and be grieving with, with, against you because of the sins that are in our lives. With whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It says, it says one more, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slender, along with every form of malice. Get rid of those. If you want to be a sanctified person, if you want to a saint, if you want God to hear your prayer, get rid of this thing. Okay, so if I get rid of bitterness, I get rid of rage, I get rid of rid of anger, I get rid, rid, rid of brawling, slander, every form of malice. So what do I replace them with? Verse 32, and be kind. Be kind. Remember what, remember what the Apostle Paul says in, 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 in Corinthians chapter 13, when in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the chapter of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Remember what I said to you when I preached that. You can be patient with people as long as it doesn't concern you. Or it may concern you, but you got a paycheck out of it. Therefore, you can be patient with your job, with your boss. But kind? You could be patient to somebody and not be kind to them. Because it's knowing that the person is wrong, but yet you still decide to do good toward them. That's what kindness is. Say, so become passionate to one another. Sit on somebody else, in somebody else, be in somebody else's shoes. Forgiving each other. That's the hard part. That's another hard one. Forgiving a person you know has done you wrong. And he says, how should you do it? Just as Christ God forgave you. Oh, as far as the east is from the west, I remove your transgression from you. Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose sin the Lord will never count against you. So therefore, we have a problem with the sin, forgive and not forget. Because I hear that a lot. You can forgive, but you don't forget. <laughs> that's, not, I don't, that's not what the Bible says. Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven. The sin the Lord will never count against. Now, that's forgetting. Because love does not keep an account of wrong. That's what it takes to be sanctified. Well, that's not what it takes. That's the requirement of sanctification is to take off and to put on. In fact, the word that is used here, no joke. It is, that's, what, that's the same word they use in Greeks when, when people are putting clothes on and off. So you saying, take, take those bad things out like a, like, like a dirty dress a dirty pants, a dirty sweater, and take a bath in the Holy Spirit and then put on the new nest. So, what is left to be said? I actually, 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 
Hold on for a second. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we were to put Psalm 1, uh, Michael, can, can you take a little time and type Psalm 1 for me? I didn't do that. But if not, I'll, if, can you do that? Okay, Psalm 1. I think someone is doing the same thing Ephesians chapter 4 is doing. What, 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 watch that. How it goes. What does someone say? Blessed, congratulations. Happy is the man or the woman or the widow or the old man or the young man, the old lady. Blessed is the man who does not. You see, those are the negative, the take off, the taking off. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the wicked. Right? Those are the things he's taking off. I'm a Christian now. I can't walk in the way of the wicked. I can stand in the way of the sinners. I can stand the uh, company of the markers. Continue. But this is what he's going to put on. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. When you do that, you are like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield your fruit in season. You're a fruitful Christian. Whatever you do, prosper. Oh, not so the wicked. They are like shafts that the wind blows away. You see the putting, you see the taking off and the putting on, the negative and the positive. I will not walk in the way of the wicked, nor stand in the way of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the marker. But what I'm going to delight in is in the law of the Lord. And I will meditate on his word because there comes the goodness and kindness and, and, and wholesome, wonderful words. But the question is, what's going to help us? I think the psalmist here and someone give us the idea. The, the psalm tells us the way it's going to be easy for us to put off our old self and put on the new self is what? But his delight is where? In the law of the Lord. Listen to what Jesus says in his prayer. John chapter 17, verse 17. What did he, that prayer I started with. What did he say in, say in the prayer? Sanctify them with your word. And your word is what? True. You cannot be sanctified without, a, without having a, a, a daily dose, a, a true dose of the word of God in you. You see, there are secondary ways, secondary ways to be sanctified, to help you renew yourself. So let me talk about the secondary way before I go back to the primary way. Secondary way to sanctify yourself is through prayer. You need prayer. You need a life of prayer if you're going to be sanctified, if you want to walk sanctified. But guess what? Prayer is secondary. I'll give you another one. Corporate worship. When you come together with the people of God, that's why, that's why, the, that's why, that's why the Bible says, um, do not neglect the gathering of the saints. Coming together. Because that helps you. And, and, and lastly, fellowship. Fellowship with making friends with people of the same mind, the same heart, people who seek in God, who can speak into your life. When you hang out with them, you know you're in a, not in a situation uh, uh, to fall into sin. In fact, they are there to build you up. 
Those are the secondary ways. But the primary way is through the word of God. The primary production of holiness in a Christian life, sanctification in a Christian life, in a believer's life, is the word of God. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. It is the word of God that conforms us into the image of, image of Christ. What does the Bible say? The word of God is sharper than two-edged sword. For the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any edge sword. It's taking away, right? It's cutting things. Oh, it's taking away. Uh-uh. It penetrates, even dividing the soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It tells the heart, uh-uh, you can't do this. Yeah, your attitude was wrong today. The word of God not, is not only sharp to, to, to do the surgery work in us. You see, when the psalmist says, search me, O God, everybody's saying it, put your word in me. The word of God renews our mind. If there is a sin you used to live in before you came to Christ, don't you ever believe or think that you cannot get rid of that sin, that things cannot change. The Word of God can renew your mind. And I tell people this all the time. As a teenage, teenager in my 16, 15 years old, I, I wanted to be a womanizer. But the word of God came when I became a Christian, renewed my mind. Renewed my mind. As a 15 year old, I already had two girlfriends. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But when, I, but when Christ take, took a hold of me and the word of God just renewed my mind. Ever since the Lord came in my life, there's not one woman who can say I ever give them a hug that was not, that was inappropriate or ever looked at a woman in a way thinking that, no, that's what the word of God does. That's what sanctification does. And I don't have the desire for this thing anyway. Because that's what God does. It's not you, it's him. Renew your mind. It changes you. Uh, somewhere around 3 a.m. in the morning when I heard Joseph say this word, I can't do this to my God in the book of Genesis. It blew my mind. I, I was ruined. I've never been the same again. That's what the word of God does. It sanctified you. James says in the book of James, chapter 1, it says the word of God is like a mirror. It helps you see. See, right? You see, before uh, a guy can, you know, can shower and get ready to go out, never take a look at the mirror, but not the lady. Ladies got to take a look, at least one look. And that's the reason, thank God for wives, because after I finish going back, you might go, oh, you, you have this in your, uh, you have this in your hair. I didn't even see it because I didn't even take a look at the mirror. But that's what the word of God does. It's a mirror. It, it, it looks like you, you look back and says, uh-uh, you need to fix that. Uh, your shirt is dirty. Go change it. Oh, don't, these colors don't go. The word of God, as, as, a, as, as a part of P Pastor Peter tell us, it's like milk. It helps us grow. It's like meat. It helps us grow. But more importantly, 
Psalm 19, Psalm 119, verse 9 to 11. Listen to what the psalmist says. How can a young person, let me, let me, let me help the young psalmist here, the psalmist here for a second, not just a young person, how can an old man, how can an old woman, how can a, a, a widow, widowed person, how, how can a young girl, young girl stay pure, stay on the path of purity, stay sanctified by living according to the word of God? You cannot sing, be sanctified. You cannot live a holy life without knowing the word of God, without delving in the word of God, without studying the word of God, without putting the word of God in practice. You cannot live a holy life. You can't take off. You can't put on. And what does the psalmist say? Continue, continue, Mike. Verse 10, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And then this is my favorite one right here. I hide your word in my heart. Why does he hide? Why? And he tells you why. Why does the psalmist, for those of you who want to be preachers, you come to a verse like this. You see, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin your, uh, against you. You ask the question, why does the psalmist keep the word in his heart so that he may not sin against God. Or what can keep you from sinning against God? Hide his word in your heart. Hide his word in your heart. Not just in your mind, in your heart. Let it sink in you. Let it change you. Let it build you. Let it make you. But you got to know the word of God, though. And you have to know it rightly. That's why it's good to study the word of God under someone or, or a place that can help you that, uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, um, divide the word of truth properly. Your word I have heeding in my heart so that I may not sin against you. So now in 2 Timothy verse 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, um, Apostle Paul says what? All scripture, right? All scripture is God breathed. All 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. All scripture is God breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training into the right stuff, righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. That's what scripture is there for. So that you could be thoroughly equipped. Scripture is there, it's God breathed. It is there to teach, to rebuke, to correct, to train in righteousness and sanctification so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. So, without sanctification, no one, no one will see the Lord. No one will see the Lord. But those who are true men and women of God will live a life of sanctification, will pursue a life of sanctification. And the way to do that 
is to take off and take on. But what helps you to take off and take on and put on? The word of God. Yes, with prayer and corporate worship and fellowship. But the primary way for a young man, for an old man, for an old woman, for, <coughs> for a widower to remain faithful to the word of God, to rewalk in the way of righteousness, to live a life of sanctification is by hiding the word of God in your heart so that you may not sin against them. So now that you've been called, you've been justified, now you are called to be sanctified. Be holy as God is holy. So next week we're going to see, next week I want to talk a little bit about the three aspects of sanctification. Uh, positional sanctification, progress, progressional sanctification, okay? And then, and then um, the uh, uh, ultimate um, sanctification. We need to understand each of those. They, they each are different. But we need all of them in order to make it to heaven, in order to have fellowship with God. Now, we, it's what time? Yeah, I, I closed my, oh, 8.25. Okay, so I have five minutes. If anyone have questions, anyone have anything we want to share um, regarding Bible study tonight? Anyone on Zoom? Anyone in house? All right. I have a quick one. I was wondering, can you elaborate a little bit more on the unwholesome mm -hmm. talk? Like, obviously, we know swearing, but anything that's not building up people. Gossiping with somebody is unwholesome talk. Um, anything that doesn't build is unwholesome. Any conversation that is demeaning to others, that has cursing, that is not profitable. You know, everything is permissible, but everything is not um, uh, profitable. Uh, um, anything that is not profitable, if that is not building anybody. If it's not good to say, don't say it at all. If you don't have anything good to say, keep your mouth shut. You so know? really, so really, no negative talk whatsoever. No jokes. No rudeness. No. Well, don't say no jokes. There are some jokes that are fine, right? Jokes that are inappropriate. Right? Because jokes is good for laughter, and laughter is good for the heart. So that's a good thing. That's not an wholesome thought. There are jokes that are inappropriate. There are jokes that are appropriate. Yeah. So I wouldn't say jokes. Yeah. But I'll say the real, the other ones you just, just said. Yeah. Uh, but I think the most two most important part in this is um, something that Christians should always keep in their mind. It's the cursing, and then the absent is always safe. The absent should always be safe among you. You shouldn't be talking about somebody when they're not around, unless it's something good. Or unless you're talking about it in order to get something good out of it. But if it's just to tell somebody, or it's just, just to gossip, you know, yeah. Anyone else? Well, I was going to say to add to that anything that's not edifying to the soul, which is what anything that is not edifying to the soul. Yeah. 
That is not Eddie. Oh, yeah, we had a song like this as mm -hmm. when we were growing up in church. Mm -hmm. Things that are not edifying to the soul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep surrounding far away things that are not edifying to the soul. Yes, sir. So the way I always looked at it, because I was in management at work for a while, um, is sometimes you have to have meetings to discuss an employee, um, which was not necessarily in a positive sense, but it was in the end to try to make something come of it, something good of it. And I always looked at it this way, is if you are discussing somebody and you're not trying to build yourself up, but trying to find a way to eventually build them up, then it's okay. Yeah. But if you're looking at it to build yourself up, put them down, then it's not okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And that, that's one, there's another model I go by. Anyone who knows me knows this about me. If you come to tell me somebody said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell that person you said, that keeps me from a lot of people coming and tell me stuff. You know, I know some pastors or some leaders who love this thing. They love people to come tell them. I don't want anyone to come tell me anything if you're not willing for me to tell that person you said. Because I'm going to say, so-and-so said that you did this. So then you could stop. So I think that's, that saved me. I, I barely have anyone come to me to gossip to me. Because, because if you tell me, then I'm going to let you know that I'm going to tell the person you told me. So, here. Yeah. So that, that helps. That, that, that keeps me from having any of those type of conversations. But it's not just about talking, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff Apostle Paul said. What I pray to God is that you could look at Ephesians chapter 4. I need to look at Ephesians chapter 4 and meditate on Ephesians chapter 4 this week. And ask God in your, I say, God, is that me? Is there anything in here I need to take off? Or is there anything here I need to put on? Or maybe to look at the end of Ephesians chapter 6 and Paul's talking about put on the full armor of God. Right? The full armor of God. And after you've done everything, so that after you've done everything to stand, you can stand firm. Right? Amen. All right. It's, I think it's past our time. Um, looking forward to see you next week so we could, do, we could finish with sanctification. We're going to talk about the positional trans, um, sanctification, progressional sanctification, and, perf and perfection. Um, you know, of sanctification. Uh, we will do that next week. And then I think by the end of this month, we, we should be done with this Bible study. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Father, I'm convicted. I'm convicted because of the things that you taught me um, throughout the week preparing this Bible study. Oh, Father, sometimes, Father God, we haven't seen the scriptures for a while and we are a, a bit oblivious of what it takes to be sanctified. And Father, you know I've watched things that I'm not supposed to. You know I've said things that I'm not supposed to. You know I've done things that I'm not supposed to. You know I've heard things that I'm not supposed to. You know I've been places where I'm not supposed to go. Father, your word, Father, guide me with your word. Let your word be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Father, let us each here, Father God, hide your word in our hearts so that we may not sin against you. Help us to walk in the way of righteousness. Help us to live a sanctified life. Help us to strive for holiness in our lives. For without it, no one will see you. And it is my desire, and I know it is the desire of every single person here, Father God, to know you and to see you, to have a relationship with you, to be able to worship you, and then ultimately to be in heaven with you for 1,000 years, to be enjoying ourselves 
and to come back to a new earth, Father God, to give you even more glory and honor than you alone deserve. We bless your name, O oh God. Make us more and more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you. And the Lord give you peace. Amen. All right, everyone. See you. Um, God bless you. Uh, uh, Mr. I think that's Mr. Ken right here. Uh, he probably left already. Okay. Um, that's fine. I'll, 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 talk, I call, I'll call him on my way. All right, everyone. Good night. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, Kelly is always, always, always driving when she comes to Bible study. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Bye, Kalia. Good to see you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. God bless. Okay. <laughs>